So in the couple of rooms that I got to pop into, I got so excited because all three of the rooms hit on at least all like three out of my four hot buttons. And I didn't get to the fourth room. So I'm wondering if like another hot button was hit in there. But um, I, I really was like so excited listening to some of your discussion because um, it, it, it was like, yes, like this, you know, the, to kind of hear um, your take on it in terms of like some of the things that kind of have my, had me shaking my head a lot and kind of just constantly mulling over like now that we've uncovered this, what do we do about it? And how do we get people to be able to move forward with it, right? Which is, I think that space between theory and action where we tend to get stuck, right? And that can be true for a lot of things, but certainly can be true for, um, for thinking of MTSS um, in our schools. Um, okay, so what we'll do now is we'll spend some time um, sharing out on some of the discussion that happened in your breakout rooms. Um, and then we will move on to the next segment, which will be chapter one. I'll go. <laughs> All right, Don, um, thank you. All right. My group can jump in at any second. Um, we spent time <clears throat> talking about um, the ice cream sundae because, you know, it's ice cream. But we talked about whether or not we liked it, the model, and, and not. And we talked about um, other people have developed their own model of, of displaying MTSS in their union or their RSU or their school as the umbrella because they felt that it was more appropriate to have it, an overarching and then have all the components that you have in your school underneath the umbrella. Um, we talked about um, equity and what if we have a number of schools in our district, like I have five, definitely not even close in um, level of resources um, because we have some, we have high rates of poverty, but not in all. Um, so we talked about what we're doing to help with that, and I'm going to stop there. Uh, our group will add on to that because you you did say some of the, um, some things that we hit on as well. I guess I'd start with um, how you guys looked at the ice cream. We just finished and when we were just starting to talk about some of those. Um, situations and I was thinking about how they referred to the master builders the teachers and um the construction and we need a, a a base a solid base and just the word the use of the words in the construction field resonated with me made it easier to understand um all the roles and what's involved but it, just to build off what you what you all talked about we we, we spoke with some of those words too but we also spoke about the, um, how inclusion was a, a word that was important and how it talks about reaching all students on on the, both ends um and also the importance of the allocating of the resources and just knowing that we have a lot of the resources just really organizing them better i guess um and was, i don't know shelly is there more in your notes did we that you had too or mark anything else well, I did get interrupted, so my notes are not complete. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> but um, I did uh, hear we were there was some conversation about that notion that I think it was something that gave someone pause. That idea that um, the practice, I should say, that students are who receive maybe specialized instruction, but that specialized instruction happens in a way such that it interferes with their accessibility, the accessibility of tier one instruction. So they're going out for specialized reading instruction during their literacy block and sort of like really thinking about um, how we might think about it differently so that kind of thing doesn't happen. I also know the group talked about equity also. Um, my take on that was that I think equity is one of those things that people strive for and that people have a hard time saying isn't important. So for me, it was valuable to have MTSS, have it be equity-based MTSS, because really at the end of the day, that's what it is all about. Um, and then I don't know, Mark, did you want to add anything maybe from when I had stepped away? Or Teresa or Linda? I think another piece that we talked about was um, when we do have students in a classroom, 
um, for inclusion, how do they feel? Like they're in the classroom, but do they feel like they belong? So with that piece around equity, and the example I gave was a student who was transitioning from a pullout model to being in the classroom, and um, he was able to take the math test. It took him longer, and he was getting more nervous because the kids around were all finishing. But he was actually, he actually ended up scoring higher than they did. He took longer, and, and that just because he was performing at a slower speed, he he didn't like he was very nervous about being in there and and felt like maybe he didn't belong. I think the discussion about the ice cream is important to have um, because I I know that in a couple of the rooms that I was able to get into and a discussion that I've even had even at the DOE with um, with colleagues is this idea that the ice cream sundae wasn't hitting home for for folks in terms of like a as a good analogy. And the, the really, the, the takeaway for me of the ice cream, and really the only good takeaway for me is that if, if tier one is the ice cream itself, and then the toppings are the different tiers of, you know, of support, you can't have a sundae if you take the ice cream away. And that really is the part that I think hits home in terms of like how, how the ice cream sundae can represent an MTSS, because, you know, if you've just got Snickers and whipped cream, then you've got Snickers and whipped cream, you're not having a Sunday, right? You have to have the ice cream. And I think that sometimes we, um, one thing I do see, you know, quite a bit and possibly you all have experienced is this supplant rather than supplement. And by the time students get to that tier three, we even have schools that consider tier three to be their special ed, or we have schools that, you know, assume that once a student gets to tier three, that they should automatically be referred for special ed. Um, and we sort of accidentally think it, it, it's all in the, the name of doing what, what we feel is what best for our students. It's not like a, certainly not a bad thing, but we sometimes take that ice cream away <laughs> and suddenly we're loading on all the whipped cream, but you know, the, the quality of the Sunday has definitely diminished. Um, other thoughts or um did where is she did jennifer did you want to um expand on the umbrella because i know that that's something that kind of hit home with you a while back as well sure uh so andrea had offered this book study this summer and that was when i first heard about this book and we started having conversations then and andrea mentioned the idea of an umbrella and so I, um, she kind of planted the seed and then I kind of took and morphed that into my own here in the district that I'm in. I'm in RSU 22, which is Hamden, Newburgh, Winterport, and Frankfort. And so I created a document um, that I'm happy to share with all of you if you want to look at it. Um, but I had created a document um, that had our umbrella and kind of our vision right now of the pieces of the umbrella um, and the ribs that would be important, things like attendance, um, academics. And so when one of those ribs um, is broken, um, then it's our job to be able to put a support in place, uh, right, to fix that and repair that. And so we took a little inventory in our district of things we were already doing um, in each of those areas. Um, and that helped us have a conversation about what are we doing, what's working, and where should we improve some things um, that we may not have in place. Um, I also had mentioned to my group that I am attending a, a conference next week on MTSS. Um, it's called like not your typical MTSS summit or something like that through Character Strong. Um, and it's a free virtual conference. And they also had a little umbrella, which, oh gosh, I'm not very good at this part, um, that they had talked about and put out. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love these peeps already because they have umbrellas too um, and not a Sunday. So um, was there anything, Andrea, you thought specific? Like, do you want me to share my document? Do you think, Andrea? Um, I did give you screen sharing if you would like to, Jennifer. I'll leave that up to you. But um, I think one thing that I would I, I think is important in terms of discussion around the umbrella as an analogy is that I, I used to really question the umbrellas that I would see that had, you know, you've got the, the umbrella and it says MTSS in the umbrella. And then underneath the umbrella, you've got 
boom, 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 like all these things that the umbrella is sort of protecting. And the kind of, and, and that always sort of made me kind of pause to think like, is that really what we're doing though? Like, are we, are we really trying to like incorporate these things under an umbrella or do those things actually make the umbrella? So are they more the spokes of the umbrella so that if a spoke is broken, your MTSS can't work as efficiently as it could when all of the spokes are working at the same time, right? And so that, so in terms of umbrellas, um, I think that that would be a topic to have some discussion around as to like how one might envision an umbrella for their school. Um, and, and is it worth thinking about the functionality of the umbrella versus just like what the umbrella is encompassing and like what sort of protecting underneath it? Um, if you want to share your image, Jennifer, you can do that. Um, I also just put the document in yeah. the in the chat, oh, and I see okay. a lot of people um, clicked into it. So we totally saw the student as under the umbrella, and that all of the pieces on top were those things that were going to keep the student dry and safe. Um, and so it's looking at those things, and if one of them is leaking or you know is broken, then the student isn't supported as well as they could be. And so it's our job to go in and figure that part out and what is needed. So. Great. And we also, I heard, um, I logged in a few minutes late, but I heard something about enrichment. But one of the things we talked about is that it might be under the academic, you know, rib that it might be that there's enrichment that's needed. So we're really looking at it as not just, you know, an, an intervention as to catch up, but also an intervention to enrich um, and perhaps accelerate. So. Great. But we, we've we put our attendance on, um, you know, a, a tiered system. So we have each of those things that we're, we're working on a, a tiered system for all of those. So Great. were there other thoughts that came up in your first round discussion with your group? I can speak a little bit. I think people hit a lot of the pieces. I think some of the roadblocks sometimes is around the staffing. So you put things in place, you have a good model. And then as we know in the past few years, it's just constant revolving staffing um, needs per day. And you're taking your interventionists and moving people around. Um, and those supports that students are needing to have in the classroom when people are not there, then um, issues arise for students. Um, and so it's just being able to manage that um, so st students can be successful with this model. Right. Okay. Great. And we are still on time. I'm so excited about this because um, I know Rachel has done trainings with me before and staying on time is a, something that I have been practicing and getting better at. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy right now that we're on time. Okay. So chapter one of the book uh, is where we sort of ask this question of what do we mean by equity-based MTSF? Right. And this was the chapter that got us into um, the foundations of MTSS. You know, what are what is the foundational framework for the teaching and learning? What is a foundational transformation in action and practices? Um, thinking about local resources and how your resources become part of your foundation and how you use them is going to um, really strengthen or um, hinder those foundational pieces. Um, what is resource mapping and why do it? Um, and don't skip the resource mapping. <laughs> like I really just, if, if I talk to schools that are really thinking about like doing an overhaul, I constantly am thinking like, don't skip the resource mapping. Just don't like do it, spend the time to do it because you're going to uncover things that you're going to need later, or you're going to uncover things you didn't realize that you had that you can use later. And then the how to do the resource mapping, which I thought was a was a great um, section of that book as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to send you off into breakout rooms again, and I'm going to give you um, this time. I'm going to put 20 minutes on the clock because at five o'clock you can feel free to uh, take a quick break. But I will bring us back together to begin the discussion at 5:05.
so chapter one, foundations of MTSS. What were some of the um, topics that came up um, in your small group? And how did your discussion form around that topic? Uh, Andrea, I'll share. Um, our group talked a lot about the resource mapping piece. Um, and especially using figure 1.5, I'm on a Kindle, so I don't have page numbers, um, with that chart, which allows you to really flesh out everything that you probably didn't think of thinking about. Um, you know, I, I think, I know uh, personally in our district, we think of resources, we're thinking about what are the programs or what is the paper, what is the tangible stuff, but it's also where you put your rooms, where you have things, the people, all of those. So it, I, I just feel like that's a really great way to get everything out. And we we talked a lot about that in our group of just different different things that we um, hadn't really considered until you look at a chart like that and think, oh, that's a resource. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, uh, time as a resource. Oftentimes we think of time more as a constraint, right? Mm -hmm. And so how can we change our perspective around our feelings and thoughts about organizing time so that we are, you know, so that we consider it more of a, like a value that we are using rather than something that's holding us back. So yeah, that's a very good point. Someone brought our group about time, I think brought up about the, in the book, how they saved five minutes, the students didn't have to transition that maybe wanted to have extra help and how they could make up, they gained that time during the day by, by just changing a transition. Yeah. Another thing about scheduling that ha often comes up is we we like to sometimes schedule things in larger blocks, like 15 minute blocks or 30 minute blocks or 25 minute blocks. And when you have to move one of those blocks, what happens to the rest of your schedule? The whole thing is impacted, right? And so the smaller that we can make our time blocks, the less impact you're going to have on your overall schedule when you have to move one of those time blocks, right? So you, you can still have 25 minutes for, say, an art block, but if you broke that down into five five-minute segments, can though it can you maneuver your time more benefit, you know, like more easily without disrupting everything else around it? And then another question that sometimes comes up, or another thought that sometimes comes up, is this idea that that each student, when they walk through your door, is given a time debit card. Every single student that walks through that door every morning has the same amount of time as another student. And how they use that time or how they're able to access that time is going to have a huge impact on their experience and their outcomes. And so, you know, your, your student that has special education services and an IEP that's, you know, two inches thick has the same amount of time in your building as that student that is valedictorian, doesn't need support, has, you know, seems to sort of have the world, you know, by its, by the seat of their pants, right? And like, they really, and they, they just, they're, they're going through their life. They, they each have the same amount of time. How can you set up your systems so that they can maximize that time, no matter who they are and, and what it is that their needs are? Other thoughts that came up from this discussion? Our group talked a little bit about um, someone from our group talked about the um, data source mapping um, and how um, in districts, in some districts, um, within one building to the other, their resources may be different that they're using and that having a system for identifying what those resources are and what are the essential ones so that it is more consistent across the district is vital and important. And um, I know our district is doing a book talk on this book to um, so the curriculum director and the standard-based teachers and the coaches, and they're looking at um, what are your progress monitor monitoring tools as well so that align with those areas. Um, so I think just seeing what you have in the district and what things you want to hold fast to and what things you might want to get rid of, um, is essential. It's kind of auditing what you have. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. 
I think another point um, to add on to that, Elizabeth, is this idea too that programs shouldn't be siloed for specific levels of failure, right? So if you have a Linda Mood Bell program in your building, that program should be as accessible to a tier one situation as it is to a tier three situation. We shouldn't wait for students to have to fail to a to a certain degree in order to be able to get access to a resource that could have helped them way, way back when, right? Um, and so creating a resource library where everything is accessible, depending on how you're going to pull the pieces together. And then you can, you instead of trying to make something work, you can break it down into smaller pieces and pull the pieces that you need and put them together like Legos, right? That's how I often think about um, like a resource mapping activity. Like I think of it as a library and in that library, you know, all your little pieces of your programs are all Lego pieces. And I need to put together um, a structure that's going to help for this particular student or this particular group or this particular class. What are the pieces I need to put together from the entire library versus like, well, they are only allowed to access this or they're only allowed to access that, et cetera, et cetera. I do like that point you bring up about having to fail, like it's fail. I mean, and I've heard that often from educators saying, you know, the model is set up that you have to fail before you can get what you need. Mm -hmm. um, and so this model is in, ensuring that what you need, you will get. You don't have to fail. It's more to be successful. And hopefully you don't land in needing to receive special education services. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that every publisher in the world would hate me for saying this, but I, I know that you're going to buy programs and I know you're going to have training where they're going to say, you know, don't don't break up the program. Just do it the way, do it with fidelity, do it the way it's meant to be. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that unless I'm trying to put together a program that's going to meet the needs of my students, right? And so when you're looking at your programming, the ones that you can break down into their subcomponents to be able to use as a, su a subcomponent might get you more bang for your buck than using a program with fidelity because that's how the publisher thinks that it should be administered. You're in control, not the publisher. The publisher is going to say that because they want you to buy their program, and that's fine. But as the educator, as the professional, you might say, hey, this section of this program could really help us get to this section of this program. Why can't we put them together and, and kind of create a, you know, make your own proprietary blend of what your students are using and what they need. Um, because the, pu the publisher is not in your classroom. They're sitting somewhere else, right? For trying to create things that are helping us. They're designed to help us. Um, but how we use them, I think, is more important than how they want us to use them in some cases. I so would just uh, go ahead. I would just add to that because that makes me a little weary, but um, just ensuring that whoever is overseeing that has that skill set to oh, determine sure. because often we throw these programs for our support techs who can plan, but don't always have that skill set to know exactly what oh, they should be. Yeah, doing. you would use, of, you yeah. would. Right, you would shape it based on, you know, who you have and, and like their, you know, how you wouldn't just, exactly, I agree, a hundred percent. Andrea, I was just gonna add, uh, I can't take credit for this. I heard it from um, B. McGarvey years ago, actually. Um, but what she said was, uh, when you buy a curriculum program, you're buying a research-based program uh, and research-based programs predict a certain degree of success for students and they're research-based because they work well for lots of kids, um, but that you don't ever really unleash the true power of a program unless you take a research-based program and use it in an evidence-based way. Mm -hmm. So when you have students that it doesn't work for, and you make the adjustments, obviously that requires a skilled educator. So there's that other thing that happens where you buy a program because you have a lot of new teachers or whatever, but that has always stuck with me that you really have to use research-based programs in evidence-based ways. 
I love that. I love that. I wish it were you had, that had said that because we can I pretend would. it was maybe. Be I can. Really I can. We can pretend that it was you, Shelley. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things I always stick to when we start talking about programs and fidelity and things like that. So. Yeah. So certainly take a break if you need to and you haven't yet, but I do want to move us to um, the next segment so that we don't um, get behind. But chapter two is where we were headed next. And um, some of the questions that form um, discussion around chapter two um, bring us to, I had to click off that screen for just a second. So give me, give me just a second. Okay, so structuring of the MTSS. Um, so you experienced the tiered matrix and why and how to use it, how to create a tiered matrix. Um, and then it broke, the chapter broke us down into four different parts of the matrix, universal support, universal screening, instruction and support, and progress monitoring. Tell us a little bit about how you experienced uh, chapter three. So I think our group might've gotten a little sidetracked. I'm just going to say up front, um, but we did Learning start happens on sidetrack. <laughs> we, we did start our conversation talking about the really like for me, mind blowing matrix, which all of a sudden, as I started to read those and look at them, I felt like I was getting sucked into that. Like, um, how did, I don't know if I can even explain it again, but I feel like there's this pendulum between sort of uh, creating a culture where Teachers, uh, all staff recognize when a student has a need and they find the resources and they respond to that need and they intervene when a student needs intervention to the other side of the pendulum, which is like, do you have this data point? Is it the, does it meet the benchmark cutoff for services that, 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 so to me, the matrix looking at those threw me right over to the, like, you have to have the right score. You have to have checked the checklist. And I found myself feeling like, um, claustrophobic. <laughs> I don't know for lack of a better word. Like it was hard. It felt to me like it was creating the opposite kind of culture um, that what I was striving for was that really organically responsive kind of culture. And so I think it's, for me, it's like trying to find the balance between the two and making it organic and having enough structure so that it happens like it should happen. Um, and then we got like, we took a sharp right and started talking about tier one and the importance of having good tier one instruction. And I will stop there because I will not, we will not stick to eight minutes if I go there. But that's the quick summary from my group. And on, on that note, Shelly, someone in my group was on the other end of the, sort of on the pendulum, but that matrix was extremely helpful because there's a necessity for the clarity and the you know, I can let her talk for by herself. She's looking at me like, I can talk by myself. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not looking at you all. <laughs> no, but you had a good point. I mean, the clarity of that was something that you need. And so maybe there's somewhere in the middle. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think what we talked about, like she said, is that people oftentimes, I'm not, some people don't do well with gray. And I think it gets hard when, um the roles get confused. And so I sort of saw this as like when we're just starting out and getting going, that this was a really structured way that people can look at a piece of paper or, you know, seek guidance that way. So I kind of thought of it as Shelly is opposite. <laughs> I always saw it as a great equalizer. If, if every single person has to use this form from across from kindergarten to grade five or like across your school or across, you know, you're really equalizing the process. The other thing that always stuck out for me um, about this particular resource was the idea of the decision rules and how like, are we, you know, instead of having to collect particular data points, it's our, have we met that decision rule? Do we know where we're going next? And is it, and has it already been pre-planned, right? Um, and so, I think that even like as a parent with my own kids going through their school's process, you know, way back when, um, it was, it was, it always sort of felt like 
you know, well, we'll try this, we'll try this, we'll try this. Whereas like a matrix sort of like puts you in that world where the paths are there. It's still a choose your own adventure about how you put the paths together, but it is an equalized process that connects that resource map to um, like it, it, it was, it, it, it can be a tool that lives in that theory to practice um, um, aspect. Any other thoughts about the matrix that came up? I love that we had two different sides of the continuum. I mean, that is fascinating. Because I thought it was fascinating when I was in one of the rooms that they were like, oh my gosh, like this was, this was amazing. And then I, and it's like, I, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> um, so. Jennifer, the rock star found it online too, in fillable form. If you want to drop it in the Hi, chat. Jennifer, you're oh, on Please again. drop, please drop. I'm not going to tell you how many hours I looked for that today. I told her what page and what thing, and it was like three seconds, wasn't it, Krista? Jennifer and I did not meet before this, just so you're clear. Okay. She, this, is, this is all her. <laughs> Any other thoughts before I move you into the last discussion? Okay, let's cover chapter three and the conclusion. And in that chapter three, um, you had an opportunity to spend some time thinking about master scheduling. So there's that time piece again. Um, I love that this book pulls the time piece out and gives it some of its own um, spotlight because as a resource, time is probably one of your most valuable resources when you're thinking about how to um, how to move forward with some of this work. But then of course there's that, um, oh, it's chapter four in the conclusion, not chapter three in the conclusion. Um, and so that, and then that chapter four of this idea of making it your own, right? And how, how could you bring this back? How could you make this work where, it, where you're working, where you are teaching, where you are um, creating and, and monitoring these? Um, and um, did anybody take the, the approach of, like self-assessment, like this is one approach that's being written about and then, but this is how we're doing, could there be a way to meet in the middle? Or it were, did you notice points where I think I wanna focus on this or I think I need to make a shift here. Or, I think my team and I need to have a discussion about, you know, whatever that is. Um, and so without further ado, I have shaken you up one more time. I will bring us together at 5.50 and we'll have our last 10 minutes. Uh, to share out about your group discussion. Okay, so the end of the book, bring it all together. Who wants to start us? We commented on the belonging statement that they had in the beginning of chapter four. Um, and just how important it is for kids or, you know, students to feel like they belong, because I think that's a huge piece. If they're not engaged or don't feel like they belong to the school, then they're not going to, or likely that, you know, they can get dropped. Um, so I, I like that they included that in that, the start of chapter four. In our in our group, um, we were just starting to get into this the area of the organizing your data part. But I wanted to pick up on um, it was Charlotte who actually hit on two key, key words for me. It was clarity and communicating. And um, and we looking at that our organizing your data. I think okay, if I've got the right universal data, and now I need to be able to organize it in a in a form in a way that's got to be going to be clear to everyone what we're looking at and be able to communicate that effectively through our team. So it's just where my brain was going as we left our conversation. That's it. I, I think you bring up a very good point. I think you bring up a very big point um, in terms of like size, vastness of the point. Um, and 
how that data is. I mean, because there's data, data, data where we've got so much data and is it being used? And, and if it's not being used, why? And how is it being used? And um, really, it, it is a it is a sticking point, I think, I think, trying to figure out the data piece. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, it definitely is a big area that needs some time de devoted to it. I was leaving a breakout room when somebody said, ooh, look at the equity report card on, mm -hmm. at the end. Did anybody spend some time um, considering the equity report card at the end? That was Teresa that mentioned that in our group. Teresa, uh, yes, that's right. I think Did your Teresa. discussion, um, were you able to like get into any discussion around it? Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the big things that stood out is, you know, making sure that we do believe in that thing of all our students. We say all our students, but does everybody always have um, actions really show all our students and making sure that we are doing everything we can for every student? And I don't know if Christina um, or Teresa can expand on that, but I remember that being something we said. I think these, when I just looked, I, first of all, I love checklists. So these little check boxes were just super satisfying, but I think that to, um, think about how these statements really play into our work and, um, it, it was Christina was talking and, and she can talk as well, but just about how the importance of making sure that all means all, that it really is all students. I think one, one thing that our group talked about is that the scale, how to scale this um, in different people, different contexts. And so, you know, is it is it a district? Is it um, in districts that have multiple contracts or unions? Um, forget what that was called, <laughs> um, but uh, that was Dawn speaking. But, um, but just in terms of like how consistent, that's a message, like how consistent do you need to be? How, how much alignment do you need to have and how much like just flavor per school, per district that you put onto this to make it meaningful for the context in which you find yourself. Um, so that was a little bit, and then I think there was also some discussion around like this chapter might be a great um, kind of coming back together as a group because this is kind of where it all hits the road a bit um, because it's like you can understand it, but then how do you actualize it in your context as a building leader or whatever role we're in. Um, just it's going to take time and a lot of like, I think, um, kind of design thinking among groups of people. So there was a little bit of a call out for that. Any other big thoughts that came up? And this can be pretty much anything um, from the whole book. Like if you, you know, like something you're walking away with or, um, could be anything. Doors open. I think um, for me, this has just been something that I really wanted to help my staff wrap their head around and make it more transparent um, and, you know, clear. And I think in my head, I have a vision of what we need to do, which this book replicates, but it's just being able to get there. And this is just going to be such a valuable resource. I haven't had time to read it all because I just got it on my Kindle last week, signing up for this one. And I signed up for a bunch of other ones, but knew I'd never get this book read in time. But just, and there were some other people feeling the same way, just being able to be part of these conversations and talk about these different elements together has been really resourceful. So I really appreciate you doing this. Good. I'm glad you're, I'm glad it's time well spent. I think the most valuable things we can do is these conversations with other people because everybody has something to contribute. I mean, I'm about as opposite as Port of Portland as I can be, but I certainly wanna hear what everybody has to say. Yeah, and I think it also validates too that we're all in this together and it's not easy work. Like someone was saying, this is hard stuff. We all know this is what we want, what's best for kids, but with everything we've been through and the different layers, it's not easy. 
No, and you saw vast differences on the continuum too in some of the discussions where some folks were way over here in their beliefs or their processes and then some folks were way over here. And so, I mean, there really is no middle. I mean, finding the middle ground, I think is, is um, there's a sweet spot in there, right? To, and then, but I think the biggest thing is making sure that for every conversation that happens around this topic, we create a new entry point for others to be able to get into, you know, having discussions around um, these topics and getting them to be more um, realized and actualized. <laughs>